Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar tonight with Larry Davis and Steve Hill, hosted by the Seattle Special Education ETSA. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. We are very excited to share this presentation with you tonight and look forward to answering your questions. Um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on our website for later viewing. Uh, your attendance is consent for video recording and publishing. Um, if you are using ASL services, please, um, uh, and need any help with pinning the interpreter's video, please let us know. Um, Janice? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Yana. Actually, if we uh, spotlight them, then they will stay on for everyone. Okay. We will. Um, uh, I think Pam or Heather will do that. Um, we are, as you guys know, we're a volunteer organization. Um, our purpose is to provide support to families and teachers and to advocate for equal opportunities for all students. Uh, we provide information, we gather input, we provide programs like this, and we work with the district in the interest of our students. Um, my name is Janice White, and we are excited to have Larry Davis and Steve Gill with us um, tonight. Um, before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of things. Um, first, we have a few meeting norms that we try to follow. Um, the first is take space, make space. And what we mean by that is um, there will be time for folks to ask questions. We just ask everyone to be aware of, of the time they're taking and to, so we can make sure that everyone has a chance to get their questions asked and answered. Um, please keep your sound on mute um, unless you're speaking. Um, Please know that there is closed captioning available. You can find it on the toolbar. Um, we do have ASL interpretation tonight. Um, so we ask that uh, you announce your name before you speak. Uh, we ask you to please speak slowly and don't rush so that we can allow for accurate closed captioning and for the ASL interpreters. Um, and just know that um, uh, we may have to take some pauses during the presentation for the ASL interpreters to switch. Um, I do want to announce that unfortunately the volunteer who was going to help us with Spanish translation um, was not available at the last minute and we were not able to find a substitute, but we are going to look into um, some other ways that we can provide access um, to the Spanish speaking community to tonight's presentation um, after the fact. Um, we uh, do have a Somali, a volunteer um, translating for our Somali families, and she's going to put her phone number in the chat um, so that if you need Somali translation, um, you can call her and, uh, and you'll get that. Um, if you can, if you could sign in to the chat with the names of the schools your child or children attend, um, it helps us as the PTSA to tr keep track of where people who attend our programs, what schools they're from, and you know what where we're getting our outreach to and where we're missing. So we really um, would appreciate that. Um, so I want to introduce our two speakers tonight. Um, we have uh, Larry Davis, uh, who has been creating bridges between teachers, staff, and parents nationally through education advocacy since 1998. Um, and as Larry likes to say, he has seen it all when it comes to supporting families on this path. Um, he brings to the conversation his experience as a district special education director, a behavior specialist, a highly capable coordinator, an elementary principal, and a K-8 classroom teacher. Um, experience and insight on teaching, learning, and student behavior guides his work. He strives to keep his presentations real and represents a refreshing sense of authenticity in the process due to his diverse range of experiences. 
Um, as an author, a trainer, and a guest speaker, his message continues to inspire audiences through the simple theme, love, understanding, and other best practices, the title of his first book. Um, tonight is the first time he's presenting with Steve Gill, who is a longtime friend and colleague. Um, Steve's first job in education before he became a school psychologist was as a driver's education teacher. And I can identify that since I have a student learning to drive right now. Um, uh, then Steve had the wonderful opportunity to study school psychology and work at the university. So he followed that path. Um, when he started his career as a school psychologist, he was working in a district with a large um, English language learner population. Uh, he realized then how little he had learned about la language learners prior to that experience. And over the years, he has completed graduate work in ELL studies and eventually created the ELL critical data process. And he has trained over 14,000 educators on the process across more than 600 school districts in multiple states. Um, Steve and his wife Ushani have published six books, a booklet, and a workbook. Um, and Steve is also the past president, a past president of the Washington State Association of School Psychologists. So we welcome both Larry and Steve tonight and really look forward to their presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Janice. We, we are psyched about doing this because Steve and I have been close friends for a long time and we met as colleagues many years ago and we function in a bubble. It's like once a week, twice a week, we're in our cars and we're talking to each other while we're going to work, we're going to different places, going to different meetings and we're in this bubble and we just kind of constantly have conversations about making a difference, what can we do, how can we help parents, how can we help staff, and this is really cool because we have a chance to open up that bubble, that conversation, and do so with parents. And I'll, I'll pass it on to Steve in a second, but this is a crazy ass period of time. Special ed is already just very complex, uh, especially for parents, but within the context of COVID, it, it just, it adds a whole other level that we have never seen before. Steve, you wanna to add to that? Well, there's not a whole heck of a lot to add to that. And I am going to tease you a little about both of our intros later because that will be fun. I just want to <laughs> make sure that folks know I'm in the dark tonight because we have no power. So I'm running off of batteries and camping gear. Um, so I'm not purposely trying to be obscure here. Uh, I, I just, this is all I have. So let's get started and let's get doing some training. Let's do it. So we're, our focus is on what you can do. You know, the, the, the insight starting this conversation came about in August of 2020. Um, at that particular time, I was really uh, honing in on what would OSPI say? What would OSPI say? In fact, what would Chris Reichdahl say when it comes to this whole notion of moving forward with education and OSPI's responsibility? And this quote, really caught my attention, that it's incumbent upon family and local districts to find solutions. And at the most, I think at the core and critical part of the conversation he had with parents and district personnel was he said, have high expectations. And he was encouraging parents to keep on pushing. I mean, to the point of being challenging in this particular light. And Steve and I have had many conversations about this quote because we both have talked numerous times, OSPI has really not given uh, districts clarity, absolute clarity on what to do. So you have people who are on the front lines at the district level who are trying their very best, but they're frustrated as all hell. And so then that gets translated to parents who are really struggling. So this is kind of a place where I wanted to start. OSPI is not providing that, that sense of true leadership in the sense to make this process easy for districts and easy for parents. And it's really a challenge for everybody. So if anybody who feels frustrated by COVID, you're, you're among thousands in that light. Okay. 
Okay, so one of the things is that we have an hour with you. And in an hour, we're not going to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> but what we're hoping to do is give you ideas and also give you like a roadmap of things that are really critical to do right now, both within working with the district and also within um, working in your home. One of the things to remember, the vast, vast majority of all people who are educators are good, caring, loving people. That's why they went into it. They love children. And right now is profoundly challenging for all people. It is amazing. I, I, I work three days a week in the Sumner School District. And it's amazing to see the number of videos that the teachers have to watch to try to learn new technology to try to do this. And uh, just like with our teachers, our families are the vast, vast majority, everyone involved is good, caring, loving people. And we're in a time that's profoundly difficult. So we're gonna work with you to talk about what are things that you can do right now that are for now with the system to try and make sure your child is getting their needs met? What are things you can do right now to set yourself up for the future if you do run into problems, because some of you will run into problems. And then what is it that you can do right now that's both for now and for the future regarding things to do in the home? And I'm focusing that more uh, on language learners, um, mm -hmm. but it also applies to our, our children with disabilities in all aspects. So why don't we go to the next one, Larry? So these are things that we're gonna cover today. We're going to cover why remote learning really truly fails in an equity lens. Part of it is remote learning doesn't work well for the majority of children. There is a small portion of children it does really work well for, but for the majority of children, it doesn't work that well you add on top of that a disability or a language challenge, and it just takes something that's hard to begin with and makes it extra hard. And I'm someone, I'm on my fourth language that I'm learning right now, and I can tell you, I know from a language perspective how much that adds to the difficulties when something isn't, when something is new to you. So we're also going to be working on talking about what are things you have to do with your district to make sure that you get the best you can get right now, but also to make sure to, in, to set yourself up for positive and or productive um, future interactions with your districts, uh, because there are definitely challenges that you will face. Looking at what we can do at home to mediate some of the gaps, we'll do an activity on that. And when we get to the activity on that, I want you to also be thinking about what are things during remote learning in general that you can be doing. So, and then of course, at the very end, we'll have a question and answer section. So Larry, this next slide, I don't think we need to say a whole heck of a lot on this. I, I think most of that was read. What do you think? No, I think we're good to go. I think we're yeah. ready to roll. Okay. Okay. So, why remote learning fails to equitably meet uh, our students' needs, some of this will be so obvious in that regards. The engagement piece, it's really a challenge, uh, obviously from when you have a disability and when you have a language issue, that in itself makes it a real challenge. Uh, but the fact of the matter, we have so many kids who are home alone and they're having to be self-monitoring themselves, where in today's world, Self-regulation, and we'll talk about that, is a challenge for kids. Uh, so that just whole notion of being engaged in learning is just not optimized within the context of remote learning. So then when it comes to internet issues, that is always an interesting one. I have the privilege to talk to educators all across the country on a weekly basis, and their technology challenges all over the place. Now in Seattle, I would assume there are fewer technology uh, challenges when it comes to simply being able to access the internet. But in some of the regions that I work with, 
their access to internet that is of the speed necessary to do this is non-existent. And then uh, there's sometimes technology where you have multiple children needing the technology and the system isn't holding up well. There are numerous linguistic issues and we're gonna dig a little deeper into that in a minute and a little bit later. Um, uh, so those are some of the things there, Larry. So on that executive functioning, and this is something that um, so many kids face today, things like having uh, organization skills to actually be on schedule with those classes, uh, would it be focus issues, attention issues, tremendous number of kids struggle, especially in this special needs category with attention issues. Number of kids will go online and instead of focusing on their class, they'll get distracted with something else and they'll go in, on the web and they'll get distracted in some other ways. We happen to have so many kids who just struggle with the whole notion of their working memory when something comes at them online, it's in and it's absolutely gone. And frequently we have a lot of kids who are doing online learning without anybody there. So they don't have that kind of relationship, that kind of connection. And we'll talk about that in a bit. It's someone just holding them to the task. We're asking kids to be self-regulated. And in the world we live in, that's a rare breed, someone who has self-regulation skills. So executive function is just challenged by almost every student participating in remote learning. So the language barriers is a nationwide issue. And one of the things that people frequently don't talk about is that we have over 400 languages in our US schools. And with that, We'll focus on a handful of our languages, our most common languages, and that helps a lot of our children, but it also leaves out a lot of our children. It's an absolute work in progress. There have been some notable improvements that I'll, I'll mention some of the things that could be getting used, but the reality is frequently the things that are available aren't even being used right now. So we have to get those under use and we have to improve everything that is out there so that we really get a, a better access to the learning by removing as much of the language factor as we can. Mm -hmm. And everything that we're talking about here is not unique to remote learning. It just happens to be remote learning amplifies it. For example, in the area of meaning or the lack of, so many of our students check out of learning when there's no meaning, when there's no connection, when they have nothing within themselves saying, I really care about this. Now it's amplified by so many times when kids happen to be sitting at home and going, this is a crock of crap. I have no reason to do this. I'm gonna go do something else. I'm gonna play on my phone. I'm gonna be busy doing something else. My dog happens to be more interesting than what's on you know, line with my teachers. And so the meaning piece is really a struggle for so many kids because they're, the content is not engaging them. And it's funny when, when Larry said that, it reminded me of when I traveled to Germany with my wife, I'm now learning German and I'll be able to interact a little bit. Before I did that, I would be sitting there like a, like a kid in a classroom and all these people would be talking a language that I don't understand. And my wife would be um, occasionally telling me what people are saying. And after a couple hours of it, I would just tell her in English because nobody understood what I was saying, don't interpret anything for me. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to smile and I'm going to nod my head. And I'm an adult with reasonably good executive functioning skills. Maybe not great, but reasonably good. Now, going on to relationships. Relationships are a fascinating thing in that a teacher who doesn't have the ability to develop really good relationships rarely is an excellent teacher. <laughs> Whereas a teacher who has that just gift for developing relationships, sorry about that. Yeah, all the interesting things that happen. So a teacher who has that gift for relationships can have average teaching skills and still be just a very successful teacher with their um, students. Now you put it into the internet world and you take something that maybe a certain percentage of the people are great with to begin with. Um, and now you see my flashlight. <laughs> um, and it becomes so much more difficult because trying to build a relationship with a classroom of students 
over a new technology is a very hard thing to achieve. And relationships are a key core critical aspect of students being successful for the majority of students. To add to that, I have a number of clients right now, parents that I'm working with, helping their kids navigate remote learning. And many of the kids have, let's say, an ADHD profile and their kids are tanking because that was the glue that held them together in the traditional classroom is that relationship, either with their peers or with their teacher. And that held it. With that, that gone, they're toast. You know, it just doesn't hold it together. And it's the relationship, and Steve will talk a little bit about parent support, a lot of relationships between the, the child and the parent is changing because the parent's being asked to be a teacher. And that has put relationships into a whole other category of challenge. And kids are just sick of it. You know, in traditional worlds, a lot of parents have checked out when it comes to, you know, helping their kids with homework alone because you don't have time to do that kind of conflict and that kind of confrontation that happens. Well, now you're being asked often as a parent to be the teacher. It's, it's overwhelming. Now, parent support was yours, but do you want me to take it? Oh, uh, sure. Okay, so, um, so obviously our parents are facing numerous challenges. You are facing numerous challenges. And one of the things when we do our activity um, and one of the things I read in an article by the National Bilingual Association thing right now is focusing in on what is truly important, not overwhelming your children, but also not overwhelming yourself because stress makes everything worse. So if you can take a little bit of the stress out of it and say, what is the thing that's most important now? And when we, when we go on in a minute or two, we're gonna also be talking about things that are comprehensible, but also compelling. So working with your children to find compelling content so that you as a parent are less stressed out and then that interaction is less stressed is one of the big things that is going on. Um, and also working with the teacher and talking to the teacher about what, or emailing maybe, what truly is critical? What is the necessary things so that you're not yourself being overwhelmed by this massive um, lift that you're trying to do? Because right now we're trying all to make the best of a situation that's profoundly difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you want to say something about educator support or you want me to take it because I'd go for it. Okay. So I'm in the schools three days a week I, because I still work for a district three days a week. And I can tell you, I also talk to people across the country every single week. And I've talked to a lot of educators about this and people who are working at district offices or um, administrators a lot of the educators right now are either on the verge of tears because it's so difficult and so frustrating, or on the verge of screaming because it's so difficult and so frustrating. And so right now they're learning new formats. So what I feel as being in between sometimes is I'm working with both parents and teachers to talk about giving grace understanding that we're all in this together, we're all in a difficult situation. And then from there, how can we do the absolute best that we can do to be understanding? Also knowing the educators, a, a huge number of the educators also have children who are in school. So they're doing the same dance that you're doing mm -hmm. um, while trying to um, teach um, our children. Go ahead, Larry. Comment. To add to this is what, what's so common in education for the last 20, 30 years is the idea that educators, teachers are asked to build an airplane while the plane is flying. That's what this is all about. So people are not given the extensive training to really get this thing, to practice it through, to work in collegial groups, to be able to kind of figure it all out. Often it's like you have to do this while in online, you are making it happen. And it's very frustrating. And that's one of the things, stress, what Steve talked about earlier, when people feel that they're not on their best game, their A game, 
stress kicks in and that reflects across you know the online through the remote learning process and it's it's a different look in that regard so let's move on one one last thing before you move on okay there was a and i cannot remember who it was there was a famous educator um uh, who is now um a politician who said when uh, um he was growing up he missed about three years worth of his education because he was living somewhere that was a war-torn area but he then went back to school got caught up and went forward so when our children go back as long as we're doing what we need to and we're planning for them and we're being creative and we're thinking it through they are going to be fine and that's yeah. one of the things we have to hold on to they're going to be fine absolutely so this is that piece steve this is your piece i'm yeah, sorry this I is mine. yes I go for it. so working toward the solutions with the districts one of the key core critical things that you have to do is you have to do things now. And when you're doing things now, have your IEP team meetings, do your amendments, focus on the goals and the measurement. And one of the things about measurement, always ask them, how are you gonna measure this? And unless you have a long successful relationship with the teacher, don't accept teacher observation. If you have a long successful um, relationship with the teacher and that's worked in the past, great. But I would suggest having some kind of a measurement that has a standard to it so that it's not about what someone thinks, it's here's the goal, did we or didn't we not reach it through measurement. Now recovery services and compensatory services. Recovery services you're focusing on what happened because of COVID as far as what did they miss out on? Whereas compensatory services, it's about what happened due to COVID because during COVID they got less of their service that they are legally entitled to. Both of these will interplay in some way, shape or form, but without you talking to your IP team, working on the goals, working on the measurement, you'll never be able to say what recovery services are needed because you won't know what should have or will be expected to occur during that period of time. Compensatory services are going to be a little easier to measure because you had an IEP that said how many minutes a week and you're going to be able to discuss, was that met, wasn't it met? Now, all of you at some time or another, I assume, have received procedural safeguards. In the procedural safeguards, it talks about those four things that independent evaluations, the citizens complaints, the mediation, the due process. With this, a lot of times I'll work with a family and they're afraid of using these. Um, you shouldn't have any fear of these. And like, for example, due process, the first thing you're supposed to do in due process is sit down and see if you can work it out. So if you have done all of the things that are in good faith and you get to that point where you don't believe the other side is operating in good faith, it's totally fine to use these. They're there for a reason. And in the end, they're all about trying to make sure that your child is getting the services that are due to them. Um, and I do you know, have one point. The, the districts, Larry mentioned earlier that our state superintendent has put all the responsibility on the districts. The districts are doing the best they can, but at the same time, they're struggling with resources and we're probably gonna be struggling even more with resources when we come back. So if you're one of the parents who has really done a great job at making sure that you have this ongoing communication and you focused on goals and you focused on measurement, you're going to have more leverage when it comes to making sure that your child is going to get their needs met long term. Go ahead there. So I'm going to add to a few things because I'm working with a lot of parents right now in these areas. So in terms of IEP team meetings, a lot of school districts are putting off IEP team meetings and saying, well, we'll meet that when we do the reevaluation. 
or we'll meet that when the IEP due date, forget that. If your child is crashing and burning and they have a need now, call for meetings immediately. It's critical. You have the right to do that. Second part, recovery services. Um, that's when, because of COVID, it's a struggle and the district is responsible to provide an, you know, additional support. School districts right now are putting off recovery services until they figure it out. Well, it could be months before they figure out. That's another area where Superintendent uh, Rick Dahl is saying, push back. You're gonna have to push back a little bit on that one. If your son or your daughter is struggling because of COVID, it's not in their best interest to wait till May or June when people figure this out. You may need to push it now. In terms of uh, procedural safeguards, Steve's absolutely right. And the one thing that I wanted to highlight is a lot of people don't know this. If you're struggling with your IEP team, just in terms of creating an IEP environment, a team meeting that's collaborative and a partnership, you could be asking for a mediated IEP team meeting, a facilitated meeting through sound options. That's available to you. And also, if you're really struggling on points, points of reference in the IEP where you're just not getting anywhere, like Steve said, asking for a mediation uh, through sound options, it's a great resource, it's available. And the issue of citizens claim uh, complaint, I could tell you this as a special ed director, former and a member of the Council on Special Ed Directors right now, citizens' complaints have power. You don't wanna be frivolous in putting out a complaint unless you have some really point, but it is powerful, it's a tool. So Steve's right. Don't be afraid of moving forward with the tools by which you have been given your rights. One of the nice things about citizens' complaints is if there is a district-wide problem, um, it, it then will help other families too. Absolutely. So this is one of those and uh, that's critical. Get everything documented. That's what happens often is that everybody's kind and everybody's friendly and then these meetings happen and then you kind of walk away going, what did we agree upon? After every meeting, after every phone call, highlight in an, in an email, highlighting what was the decision? What was the action that was agreed upon? Who will be responsible? What's the timeline that this decision will be played out? And most importantly, how will it be measured? Whether it be if they're gonna be adding a new book to your child's kind of a, a new curriculum. What would that decision look like? How are we gonna measure the efficacy of that? If they're gonna be adding a paraprofessional to your son or your daughter's program, when will it happen? What will it look like? How do we know if it's measurable in that way? highlight all those agreements in an email, send it to everybody saying, thank you so much. We really appreciated meeting. Here's what we see. And then they have a chance to respond in that regards. At a deeper level, when you're meeting at an IEP team meeting, when you collectively come together, expect the prior written notice, that official document saying, this is what the district agrees to, expect that to come to you in a reasonable time. In fact, sometimes a school district could create the prior written notice right there in real time. So you walk out with a document. I know Steve, you have some things to add to that. Yeah, when it, I'm, I do a lot of training for districts on prior written notices. Um, it's a hard thing for people. It's a, it's a goofy document. It's written kind of back and forth. Um, I, but make sure when you get it, that it makes sense. It documents what, what you um, are saying. And to back what Larry is saying, um, if you don't have it within about 48 hours, and I'm talking like school day hours, um, check on that. Because it's hard to exercise your rights as a parent if you don't have in writing what the decision was. Mm -hmm. And also going back to what Sir Larry was saying, when you send them a summary of what you think was the, the decisions and thing up, a prior written notice won't cover everything. So you send them, you know, what, what else is there? Make sure that each and every time you get a response um, and you require a response from them because I'm one of the school sites that every district I've ever worked for, if there's a problem situation, I get called in. And it works much better 
when I can see a trail of all the steps involved and then I understand where we're at. And part of that trail is making sure that communication has gone back and forth. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Larry. To add to this is human nature is, is a condition where we often avoid conflict. We do whatever it takes. And again, as Steve said, really good people with good intentions, our teachers, our principals, our administrators. And when there's this conflict, sometimes things are said to just make the problem go away. It feels like that. It happens. That's why by documenting, hey, this is what the decision, this is the action, this is who's responsible, this is the timeline, and this is how we're going to measure it. Is this how you guys heard it? This is how it was done. Do you guys see the same thing that I see? Double checking through email is powerful. So you have a documentable kind of record of what was going down. It's really important. Um, we could talk all day about the culture of education. I could speak for hours on that one. But the bottom line is sometimes things just are spoken, but there isn't the follow through. Move on. Now, this is the good part. This is the part that this is exciting. There's things that you could do. So let's kind of roll with that one. There are things where you can do to mediate the gap. And this is this is so this is so real in terms of I mean, when Steve and I talk about this every day, practically, is saying, what do kids really need to know, you know, when it comes to a comprehensive education? It, there's some really core basics, and you could do this at home, giving your kids some rich experiences that will really keep them engaged. That's what this is all about. And the way I say it is, let's bring fun back into fundamentals. And an example of that would be, with reading, for example, find out what do your kids love? What do they enjoy? I remember years ago where Thomas the Train was like the biggest gig of all time for some of our young kids. Then why don't they use Thomas the Train to help kids learn how to read? Because if that's their obsession, go for it. Whatever it is that they like, build from there, whether it be audible books, whether the books that you could read, it, it doesn't really matter in terms of the content per se, as long as it has meaning, what do they love to do? Capture that interest. And the other one is a lot of the kids like um, to dictate their own stories. There's an example of Mad Libs. It's something I grew up with as a teacher back in the 80s and 90s. I used Mad Libs. It's out there still. Kids love creating their own stories and they love reading them to you. So those are just some things. What we're talking about is finding reading material that your kids really like. And if the kids are not engaged in the reading content that the teacher is presenting, ask the teacher and say, hey, can we go sideways with this? My son wants to read this. He loves reading, he's engaged. Let's take the time now to really try to build those connections. And the same thing goes for math. My God, anything that could be a game that involves math, go for it. Yahtzee's a great one. There's so many good games. Cooking is crazy as in how to gauge kids with something that's meaningful and fun. And there's so much math involved in cooking. That's what it's about, making this fun for kids so they can learn and practice to use all those kinds of skills, but they're doing it in a way that has meaning in that way. Steve, could you go into the written language? Okay. So <laughs> with the written language, one of the things that um, we struggle with here is we're really struggling with teaching written language in the schools. Everywhere. And uh, it's fascinating to me because it is as simple as starting with write down what you just said. Or if a child has difficulties with writing, you give them voice to text. Absolutely. Or you might have it where they have sentence starters and there's all different things. It can be journaling. There's all different things that you can do to take some of that out. I've worked with several kids in the last year that all of their ideas are great, but because of either sensory issues or um, executive functioning issues, the actual act of writing is torture for them. And we're switching over to more voice to text, and then they're able to do grade level work and demonstrate their knowledge. 
because we're not putting something in the way that's not important. With those same kids, once you break over that hurdle, then you can get them to work on, let's say, individual sentences, because it's right. still really important to teach individual sentences, because if they have to fill out a form, different things like that, certain tests. So finding that balance so that you take that big pressure off of them, while then, because you have, have helped them and motivated them, they'll then work for you on the part you want to. And Larry mentioned earlier, the thing about fun. We don't do fun for the sake of fun. We do fun because it works. And uh, we're looking for what is compelling to the child. So mm -hmm. one case that I worked on, and it, it was very unusual to me, to me, but this child loved vacuum cleaners. So I asked the entire staff, if you have your vacuum cleaner manual, bring it. We ended up with like 70 or 80 vacuum cleaner manuals for this child. He was reading them. He was doing math based off of the characteristics of them. He was writing about them. He was doing all core key critical skills because it's what was interesting to him. Now, to so add to, can I, go jump, can I jump in? And to add to that, so, so in a, you know, Steve and I, we, we've worked with a lot of families where kids are on the autism spectrum where that hyper-focus is really a critical piece. And his story resonates absolutely. I have so many examples of kids who they have their thing, their obsession, and that gives them a sense of calm. It gives them a sense of just accomplishment. It gives them a sense of comfort by doing something that has meaning in that light. Build upon that. Just find whatever it is that fits in that light. It's the same thing within the context of ADD, ADHD, where you have that hyper-focus, where kids could really do a variety of things. An example of whatever, I know kids who, if they were given an opportunity to do Minecraft, but bridge it into the content of their learning, meaning if they were like middle school kids and they're studying something in ancient Rome, if they had an opportunity to build an ancient Roman, let's say society or some kind of artifact, but they were using Minecraft, they'd spend forever doing that. And they would bridge the learning from that. It's, it's just awesome. Hands-on kids, kids who really like building things. Um, they like doing little models or they love that kind of thing. Building pieces from whatever they're learning in social studies or science or whatever. And then they have a chance through in like written language is to notate or label the different pieces. It's getting them to write, but like Steve's saying, it's not just fun for the sake of fun, there's meaning to it. And so those are the conversations that we see within remote, but it's gonna be moving forward. If these kids come back to school, meaning is gonna be everything outside the contact of relationship. For these kids to be connected, they're gonna be doing these fun things. The other one I see here is journaling. If kids had a chance to like draw and just do doodles, and then do all that and put words as well as pictures into what their day was like and what they're learning, or maybe just describing their day and has nothing to do with what they learned. Those kinds of things work really well, especially in written language development. So I'm gonna pass back to you, Steve, on ELL. So for our language learners, we are getting a lot more technology that is helpful out there but we're also not accessing some things that are, that are there that are amazing. There are amazing quantities of videos on YouTube that can really help our language learners gain different knowledge because the next one down is knowledge, but also gain language skills. For just an enormous number of the languages, they have different leveled videos to really help the person gain the skills because what you need is that comprehensible input and there's a ton of that in those videos. There are tons of audiobooks out there across numerous languages that allow a child to get different knowledge while either building their English or building their native language um, so that they can have that transfer of knowledge across the two languages. There are some amazing interpreting and translating programs out there, voice to text that is um, available to you. Lots of districts are using a program called um, Snap to Read or it's Snap and Read. I always mix that up, but it's Snap 
to read um, as part of that. The co-writer is a program a lot of um, districts are using to help kids write. Both of those now have a ton of languages. And I say a ton because I don't know the exact number because it just keeps changing. They're adding more and more languages to both those programs. And the Snap to Read allows a child to take a part of the screen, any part of the screen, and it will read it to them in their native language, allowing them access to that content where co-writer is a program where you can be writing in whatever language. And it's like a word prediction, but it's a little more um, helpful than a word prediction uh, program. And there's a new one called Immersion Reader, but I haven't seen it, but it's been it's being talked about on the national level. And like I mentioned in the, the knowledge, there are so many videos out there that provide different knowledge across numerous languages. And when it comes to knowledge, getting it in your native language is perfectly fine because then you have it. And the more knowledge that you have, the easier reading becomes because one of the requirements of reading is to have the knowledge so that things can be related to and made sense with. So now let's go on to the activity. Go ahead, Larry. And we've been a fire hose, just as a reference. We've been a fire hose of just like, just, just sharing all this. So this is really critical for you to just kind of move forward. But let's, let's take a moment and just, as you said, I'll let you run with this one, Steve, but yeah. just allow so much of what we shared to just kind of download here. Yeah. You're going to be put into groups by our wonderful folks um, uh, from the PTSA in a, in a minute or two. And what you're gonna do, we'll switch back to that previous screen in a moment, Larry will. Um, and you're going to take any of the ideas that we mentioned on that previous screen, and you're either going to talk about how to improve them or how to personalize them, or in any of those categories, an additional idea. Because when we have you come back, what we want you to do is share. So what you've had is you've heard several ideas from us of things that you could be doing at home to really make sure that your, your child is gaining knowledge right now. But then on top of that, you guys are gonna talk about how to make it better and maybe other ideas. And then we'll come back, we'll share and everybody will gain from the group knowledge. So if the folks from the PTSA can just go ahead and put people into the group. And uh, Larry, how many minutes do you wanna give folks? I usually give about five for that. Yeah, it sits at 750. Um, let's see. How many people totally do we have out there? Just as a reference. 40, uh, no, 39, 39. Okay, got it. Including us. Uh, you know, let's stretch it a little bit. So I think about seven minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So go ahead and put people in groups, please. This is Pam. Um, I'm checking in to see if there's anybody um, who's, who's a participant who needs interpreting services. We want to be sure to group those with the ASL interpreters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Steve, and do you want to join a group uh, if anybody speaks Spanish and that's a particular... Um, do we have any Spanish speakers here that... That I could help on during a group. It was on for a while, I guess. Yeah, it's still plugged in. Okay. Yeah, let's just go for it and start putting folks into groups and. Alrighty. And do you have a preference for group size? Um, I would say with thirty-seven people, um, like five five groups, and then there'll be mm -hmm. uh, about seven eight people in a group. Does millimeters? Probably. All right. tape in sure. Augustus's room definitely does. Make sure that uh, you're on mute. All right, I'm going to send everyone to the breakout rooms.
Pam, can you hear me? Yes. So are we not in a room? Uh, we are not in a room. Do you, I thought you were in a room. Do you want me to assign you a room? Um, sure. Sorry, I'm trying to type up the questions to send them out. And it didn't look like we had anyone who needed to be. Yeah, we might a be. Specific a, yeah. I'm looking for where your name is. Where is it? Oh, I guess it's not. Huh. You know, I can, it, I've got a thing that lets me just join a room. Yeah, so. just do that. Just do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to join a room that doesn't have like somebody who's a natural like Larry's in a room, Steve's in a room. I saw Cheryl Lynn in a room. I'll join a room that doesn't have anybody. Yeah, room four, room four. Yeah, Hodan is in a room, so she can probably run. I'm looking at room four, so I'll join room four. Okay. I'll be. I'll just be hanging out here. Hi, Elizabeth and Madison. This is Pam. It, I'm just just confirming. I didn't get any notice that anyone needed ASL services. Is that correct? Yeah, I well, as far as I'm aware of, yeah. Yeah, we don't have any way of getting notice. But I looked through the list of people who'd signed in, and there were no familiar names or suspect <laughs> suspect schools. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't. Usually they'll type me a personal message or right. you know and i didn't right. get anything so i just glad you popped back in and know how to do that thank you <laughs> yeah. well I'm sorry, was... I'm off, I'm sorry i'm off camera but when i'm like managing the behind the scenes i can't <laughs> it's too many things <laughs> too many well things. i was in a breakout room with larry and two people who never unmuted and one other person so i was kind of like i'm getting out of here <laughs> <laughs> yeah nobody in my breakout room seemed to, seemed to need services so Okay. And Madison, we could just restart the clock when. Sounds good. Back. Okay. It's easy. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid is how I like to operate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For some reason, that's the hardest part of the job. I don't understand. <laughs> the time how hard is it? <laughs> Which? I don't remember. <laughs> I know. Whose turn is that? What? <laughs> 
I see Case, uh, I'm not going to say this right, I apologize, Casian, Cashin is here. We're in um, small groups right now. I'm happy to send you to one of those breakout rooms or you can hang out here with us. Yeah, that, that's that's fine. Do you want me to send you to a breakout room? Well, I, I, I think I probably missed the, the whole thing. I just joined, so I just realized the meeting started at 7 p.m. So, uh, well, it is recorded. Yeah. Well, we'll cut out this part of the video, <laughs> but it's recorded, so you didn't miss anything uh, in terms of that. So, but yeah, we'll, they'll be coming back shortly. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Larry, you ready to bring everybody back? I think you're on mute, I can't hear. And I'm gonna go back to my screen, okay. Are you ready to bring everyone back, Larry? Let's do, yeah, let's do it. I'm just going to give them 30 seconds to wrap up there. Thank you. You're, you're, you're gracious in that. <laughs> I sometimes was a taskmaster and I'd push the button. Right. I'm closing the rooms. Do you have to put up a presentation again? Or are you? Do I, I have it? Okay, let me see. I'm going to exit that. I just didn't know if you needed to. I'm going to pin everyone again. Uh, okay, I'll share screen. Let's see what we do. Boom. Yeah. Interpreter Elizabeth should be on screen. Yeah, sorry that when the screen got shifted, it it shifted everything. So I'm getting yeah, back. That's okay. Just just letting you know. Thank you. It should have closed the room. Oh, now it's saying one minute. Apologies, I closed the room, but it did an automatic timer for me. <laughs> it's not letting me. Sorry about that. Sometimes this pre-settings. 
Yeah, thank you for managing this. And thank you, it's been great. Okay. People will start reappearing. Okay, I think we have people who are, are back into the big group. So here's the time where you unmute yourself, take turns and people share something that it could be what you said that everybody thought that is a great idea or it could be something you heard in your group that you thought, oh my goodness, that is a great idea. Because what we wanna be doing right now is sharing great ideas that people talked about during that time. So go for it. Now, one of the things you have to make sure is to take turns. So don't fight over who gets to go first. Make sure you're taking turns here. And my wife always says, you think you're funny. And I said, well, somebody has to. Now, I'll share an idea. Somebody was talking about their son having a tough time with writing. And uh, they realized he loves to watch certain videos um, on there. And they talked about how the person who does that video creates an essay and then talks about that. So what comes first as you introduce it? Then what is the big content? And then what comes at the end? And one of the things I mentioned is we need to stop making writing such a mystery to kids. We can give them a roadmap. We can literally tell them how to structure it so they don't have to think about it. And then they could watch that same video and say, okay, what was first? Take a few notes. What was talked about? Take a few notes. Then how did the guy or gal summarize it at the end? That's an essay. That's something somebody talked about in our group. Somebody from another group, what was something that came up in your group? This is Sherlyn. Um, and I will say one one thing just in terms of space that was interesting was uh, someone said they've got they've got the closets the the classrooms are closets and so for um, kids who can easily get distracted the fact that they can be in a small space without a lot of distraction is an option. Yeah, yeah, it, especially if they like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's against the rules to lock them in a closet, but if they like the small confined space, absolutely. Anyone else wanna share? While you're thinking about it, I'll tell you something that I read this last week. I'm on a newsletter for the National Association of Bilingual Educators, and they put out their kind of best article. And uh, one of the things that really surprised me was how little content that the best article in the year had about what you do for remote learning. And that really shared, helped me understand it is tough, you know. Um, I, so they brought up avoid overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That's for our kids, that's for our grownups. They brought up the tech tools. We've talked about a lot of the tech tools. Um, they brought up the tools that do the translating and interpreting. They brought up self-directed learning. We've talked a little about that too. And they brought up the Rosetta Stone, which I didn't talk about earlier, but some people will, will joke about Rosetta Stone that is kind of boring, but the good news is it's highly effective. If you do it little by little, if you try and sit there for an hour each day, you'll give up on the third or fourth day. If you do 15, 20 minutes a day and you're learning a new language, and you just keep doing it in bite-sized chunks, it's highly effective because it comes at it from a variety of directions and it uses really good pictures. So that's one of the things I read this week. What's some other things people came up with during their groups? 
Uh, Larry and Steve, this is Janice speaking. Um, I'm wondering, we do have a number of questions and looking at the time, I'm wondering if it would be okay with you if we move to the Q&A. We can do that. Let's Great. do it. Okay, so um, um, I'm gonna call on people who put um, questions in the chat or indicated that they, you know, wanted to make a comment. You can, you can unmute yourself um, when I call on you or... Um, yeah, so Hodan, you are actually up first. Hold on. Yes, I'm listening to the parent. Hold on. It's, it's, it's been a while since, um, so she's talking. Hold on one second, please. Sorry. I... So this, the parent, I had a question. She has a child, um, a, a, a young man just turned 18 um, in high school. So the question um, to you is that she's saying that um, she is requesting um, um, reco recovery services. Mm -hmm. but he's going to be going to a transition next year. How does that carry on in a different building, a different setting um, on, 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 on that level? And then she's also mentioned uh, being a, a parent, English is second language. She said, you have shared a lot of tools, but she said, it's difficult. I, I'm, I also work. I have to put food on the table. I'm a single mom. Uh, yeah. When I come from work, I try to implement some of the work with my son but it's very difficult. Is there videos that you can share with us? She said, um, maybe that we can, um, that's there right now. She said, what we're relying on is YouTube. Not even yeah. teacher. YouTube is, is more helpful um, uh, uh, for our kids right now. That's what she said to my son. Um, it's very hard for him to sit. She has an autistic son with, with a severe disability. Yeah. So Larry, you want to talk about the recovery service or you want me to jump on that? Uh, you know, in terms of the recovery services is that the school districts are right now holding off and it's a matter of you're needing to push back. As the superintendent of OSPI said, they need to push back. The IEP team needs to have these conversations now of recovery services. Um, so if the district continues to, to present itself that we're not ready for those recovery services, I would say that you need to look at, that person needs to contact, I'll give you an example, uh, Washington PAVE, W-W-A-P-A-V-E. -A -V -E. uh, they're an organization of advocates uh, that are ready to help families across the state um, with that kind of negotiation. And that's what they do. I do this as well, but I highly recommend uh, the folks at PAVE because what we're doing is the law was written, the practice was written not to wait until the district decides to wake up. Power is at the IEP team meeting to discuss what your son or someone's daughter needs now. So my recommendation is to move forward with advocacy support and look at the, uh, the, the people at pave.org as a possible resource. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention that a lot of times when the people or districts are talking that way, they're basically saying we're not ready, but ready means never. So don't accept that. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, you just have to start working. And the, the parent mentioned the YouTube. I, I can tell you as I um, learned German, um, YouTube has been absolutely fantastic for me. And there is enormous content across enormous number of languages. Um, and uh, part of it just is going in there and searching and then you'll find something great and you'll watch all the videos by that person. You'll find another one, um, but you can find an enormous amount of knowledge. I, I wish there were a lot of other things, but the reality is there aren't. The, to add to it is asking the school personnel, whoever your IEP case manager, whoever they are saying, I need you to be a facilitator of information or resources for my son or my daughter. I don't need you to directly teach everything for my son. So I need you to look at what would be the, the YouTube uh, resources that might target my son's learning. Yeah. What would be those resources that are online that might target my son's learning and pass that back on to 
the IEP case manager and say, we're needing help at home specifically to find resources. Can you help us? And if you can't, who can? It's putting it back, pushing back. That's what we're being called to do. Uh, Marina, you had a question also about language issues, I think. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, oh, hi. Yes, Janet. Uh, thank you. My name is Marina. So it, it's myself. Um, th there was a slide talking about uh, every meeting should, every meeting should uh, uh, write a summary about that. So my question is that what if myself or have, have the issue myself, I, I can't, I'm trying very hard and, and this shit isn't making it easy for us. So in that case, I barely um, trying to catch whatever I could, but most of the part I need to translate, I need to process, I need to respond sometimes mm -hmm. also because my my student is around, I also need to take care of that part. So it's, it's very, very difficult. What would you suggest a parent like me to do? I I went against that. I, I say that no, I don't want to bring my student in, but then the, the the school team was like a no we we are not happy if you don't let your student in but it's a huge destruction to me at my end so in in my position what would you suggest me to do so I I'm trying to understand I hear a few different questions is one of the questions that when you're having a meeting with them. They want to make you sure your son is in the same meeting. Is that one of the questions? Yeah, you are at a meeting. It's the IEP meeting. Yeah. How so, old is your son again? Uh, a grader. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of districts will push real hard for that. And I, I hear where they're coming from, but at times we have to make sure that the parent who is protecting the rights of the child fully can engage. And there are times where the child um, makes it so the parent can't fully engage and can't be a meaningful partner. So you as the parent need to make the decisions there of when it is best and when it is not best so that you can make sure that you can guard the rights of your child. Now also, would it be easier for you if the meetings were in your native language? Or of course, had an interpreter? So it doesn't help much. Okay. So think about that. The 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 the, the person who translates, it has to have the knowledge about special yeah. education, about the law, yeah. and also trying to translate. And mm -hmm. I have that a couple of times. It's a huge mess. It's even worse. Yeah. So. Um, so myself, it's kind of learning the law alongside getting help, uh, some parents are helping me, uh, also professional, I'm, I'm attending workshop, but still with my language ability, it's very hard to translate, uh, ab ab absorb them, translate, respond, and also okay. the past IEP meeting went really, really bad. So, in front of my face, the case manager told me in the whole team, nothing changed. And then I had my, my child with me, my student with me. Mm -hmm. And then end up find out there's a huge change in it, including placement, huge, I mean it cut a lot. So that I could not find out until I got the hard copy of the IEP document and I it's now call into it, then I find out, oh gosh, it's not, nothing changed. It changed, it changed a lot. So a question for you, are you more comfortable sending them written correspondence in your native language? Um, unless the IEP can translate into my language, otherwise. Well, the IEP probably won't be translated into your language. That's a really long story, but mm -hmm. 
when you send them something and you're asking them questions, um, are, is it more comfortable for you to write your email to them or your letter to them in your native language? Yes or no. Uh, okay. In some case, um, it, it, it's just, it's a matter of fact that yeah. there are some terms, even there's no such a thing, you cannot translate. Yeah, I it that way. Yeah, so, so there, there are two things I'm going to recommend to you bef before we go on another parent. Um, one is to make sure that you put the onus or the responsibility on them. Um, a district can get an interpreter who does have knowledge of special education um, if you push on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a very important thing to do. Um, and also um, put the, the responsibility on them as far as if you feel more comfortable writing something in your native language and using a few of the English terms because there isn't a good uh, translation for them, do that and put the responsibility onto them. But I, I'd love to talk to you more, but we have to make sure we uh, get to a few other parents too. I'm going to add to this. Um, I think that contacting um, the King County ARC, the parent to parent program, it's almost impossible for a parent to navigate IEP meetings, special ed meetings alone because you're juggling so many pieces of this puzzle all at once, it's overwhelming. By having somebody there makes such a huge difference. That's why in the last parent I was saying, the Washington PAVE organization, that's one organization, but in the area of King County, the King County ARC has the parent to parent program and they have resources that might be able to have someone attend the meetings with you. It'll make a big difference, huge difference, okay? Okay, um, Lisa, if you're here, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, I will, I will go look for Lisa's question because I remember it was a good one and a couple people said I have a similar mm -hmm. question. But meanwhile, Anne, if you want to unmute yourself. Seems like Anne might not be here. Hi, hi, oh. I'm here. But I, I know I'm spouting off on the comments, but I don't have a specific question. Um, uh, in in our small group, um, we, we just talked about the kind of randomness of the one-on-one uh, -on -one supports for kids who need uh, that extra level of engagement online. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also like to say hello to Larry, who won't remember me, but uh, my son is now going to be graduating as a senior. Awesome. And uh, we have needed support to get through this with him as a, a twice exceptional student since 2005. And anyway, Larry, we've been, you know, inspired by your work. So, hi. Anne, write me sometime, okay? <laughs> no, we'll do. Please do. So it's I found been a Lisa's, long and rocky road. <laughs> I found Lisa's question in the chat, so I'm going to read it because I, I I'm guessing that um, it's common to a lot of people. Um, a few of my child's IEP goals don't make sense in a remote setting. I'm reluctant to move them from the IEP because I want it to happen when in person starts. Is this a good idea, or is it better to update everything, all goals, to work now? They don't have to be removed, but the team, you can have an IEP team meeting and you can agree that these don't make sense right now. And if somebody says, well, we're gonna remove them, say no. no. We can have a prior written notice that just says that these specific goals will not be targeted during the remote learning and they will go back into being targeted as soon as we return. Um, but removing them means that you're just gonna have to go through a mess of putting them back in and if you remove certain goals, you could be removing a service area and you can't remove a service area without doing a new eval. And that becomes a very messy situation. Larry? So to add to it is that somebody is probably not wanting to go through the hassle of what 
you're asking them for to do. So again, using Chris Reichdahl, the OSPI superintendent's recommendation to push back. Yes, Steve's spot on. Say, we want new goals added. Prior written notice, just making sure that those goals are specific to a remote learning process. Put measurement and measurability to it. Move back. Contact the meeting as soon as possible. Like do that ASAP. Uh, Cindy, if you're here and would like to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Um, I just wrote that one question um, regarding um, our son. They just keep delaying in-person services um, and he can't write at all. Um, just wondering if, like, what are our options? So what do you mean by he can't write at all? Are you talking about the physical process? Or are you talking about the ability to gather the thoughts and put them into a written form? Well, he's in kindergarten. So oh. we've, we've uh, thought about pulling him several times, but then they keep saying, we're going to have services. So we would keep hanging on and then they would move the services back and move them back. So here we are. Are, we, we are they having an OT work with you? No, uh, okay. he had an uh, in-person evaluation yesterday yeah. uh, for fine motor skills and they, she couldn't even complete it. She said he was having meltdowns, yeah. so yeah. 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 And, and the thing is, even before OT is added as a service, the OT could be working with the classroom mm -hmm. teacher, providing mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. of things that could get started. And I think you might've been in my group and I mentioned having kids, uh, little kids, work on mazes that are age appropriate, work on dot to dot, working on connecting letters, especially if the book makes pretty pictures when you're done and cool stuff. I have seen that work wonders for little kids who just hate the process of writing. But the other thing is if the child has sensory issues, going and finding different types of pens, Pencils, mm -hmm. you have sensory issues. Pencils are horrible. Finding different pens, especially pens that have that roller mm -hmm. ball or even mm -hmm. markers and working on a, a, a board. So you remove the sensory issue from it. But the OT should be able to help with all of that. Yeah, thank you. To go back to that, answering the question a little bit more, if, if you have um, a process where there's a formal evaluation and for some reason they cannot complete the evaluation because dysregulation or sensory or whatever it is, and they are unable to complete the process, that leaves you an opportunity to uh, seek out and ask for an independent education evaluation because there might be other providers out there who might be able to do the assessment, do the evaluation through other means, other techniques, other strategies, it might be other settings. Uh, because ultimately your team still needs to crack the code of what makes your son tick in that way. And the evaluation is supposed to do that. So you might have an independent education evaluation ahead of you. Uh, that's in your procedural safeguards as well, describes that. Uh, that might be uh, another way to look at that. Okay. Gina, if you're here, could you unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Um, so I had uh, asked in the chat, um, I had applied for compensatory services through SPI mm -hmm. and um, have been working with my district with that. The um, IEP team uh, asked me to refer to it as recovery services as opposed to comp compensatory services. And I was curious as to why they were very uh, specific about wanting that language changed and if it will make a difference in the outcome. So it could be that what they're doing is completely innocent. Could be. It could be that what they're doing is strategic. I don't know. I haven't worked with the team. There is a difference in that calling it recovery services basically is saying that they didn't have a failure to meet the IEP. Mm -hmm. If they had a failure to meet the IEP, then it needs to be called compensatory services. Larry? 
Okay, so we don't completely agree on this. Okay. Um, so the way the key word is, from my interpretation, is that the reason why they did not meet the needs in the IEP was because of COVID. Okay, the COVID condition created a dynamic so they could not complete the services that were uh, required within the IEP. Where compensatory is there are other reasons, other, other explanations for their lack of services, but it's not because of COVID. I would say that there is a, um, I've heard this, 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 this issue, and I ran this by uh, an attorney that I work with regularly um, recently. There's an actual legal issue here. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give out legal advice in terms of what's in your child's best interest because I don't have enough information, but I also, because uh, that's not the gig that I kind of walk, is what would be in your child's best interest to go compensatory or and to, go to, uh, to go to recovery. I do know if you're working with the district collaboratively and they're working in partnership with you, if you're still able to get the same end game that you're looking for, whatever they call it, may just be the you know may be an excellent solution because steve's right there may be on the back end of the story they might have more resources in a different way i just know that the notion of compensatory has a intensity to it because it has you failed to produce and the services within that iep where re recovery it kind of has you did fail but it was you have a good excuse it has a different flavor to it, a different tone. So yeah. there's a there's a legal element to this story that you may want to run by uh, legal counsel just to ask that question. And there's lots of different people out there um, who might be able to answer that question. Another person to run this by is OSPI has the parent liaison. Okay, Scott uh, Rab who is the, uh, the, the parent liaison, he's excellent. He's a fantastic resource. He works with the team at OSPI. You could ask him that very question, um, given the situation, and he likely would get back to you pretty quickly. So that's Scott Raab, R-A-I-B, and he's the parent liaison at OSPI. I'd highly recommend because you've paid for his services and see what he has to say, okay? Wonderful, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And um, some of our members have posted in the chat um, Scott's email address and also information on the OSPI website about the services he can provide. And we've presented him um, uh, twice um, uh, to do presentations for the PTSA since COVID right. started. So um, um, uh, he is a great resource for families. Um, Tricia, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. I just had a quick question about um, if you have any like creative ideas on how paraprofessionals, like one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals can be used during this time of remote learning. Um, mm -hmm. my, my daughter's only in third grade um, and I feel like she's there, you know, during the meetings, but I just want to know how she can be utilized at best, you know, during, during this time. Steve, can I jump in on that one first? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, like Steve had talked about earlier, relationship is a critical component, and then meaning is the other. Those are two components. Uh, a paraprofessional could be uh, right now can, connecting with your your child on a daily basis, checking in. Hey, you know, ten minutes every day, fifteen minutes, whatever. How you doing? And What's going on? How's your day? How's your work day? How's your activities? How are you doing with homework? So the daily check-in, excellent resource for a paraprofessional. Teachers generally don't have the time to do that, uh, but paraprofessionals might. That might be one way, number one. Number two, in terms of the meaning side of the equation, if the paraprofessional knows that there's going to be a variety of instruction coming down the pike in a given week, uh, for example, it might be reading and math or whatever it might be. If she front loads that information with the core instructors, the paraprofessional could be doing front load teaching, preliminary teaching, priming teaching, 
getting the, your daughter ready for those experiences, whether it be like Steve had said, maybe showing a video and presenting that, making the connection, maybe playing a little bit of a game online with it, with, that utilizes that skill. So there could be a front-loading experience. So checking in on a daily basis, doing some front-loading of pre-teaching, pre-teaching is the term, and then also on backfill, post-instruction, just following up with the, the, the skill sets that maybe happen in the general ed classroom or in the main classroom, following up with uh, backfill on reteaching some of those skills. So those are the three activities that I would highly recommend um, for a paraprofessional. Steve, do you have anything to add? I, I completely agree that paraprofessional in this case is a one-to-one -one, should be spending all of their time helping your individual child not sitting there in some extra video. So I would work with that teacher and that professional to talk about how is that person going to provide a service to my child, not just sit there and watch. Absolutely. Thank you. And that is not an insult to that paraprofessional in any no. way, shape or form, um, uh, not in the least. It's like, a yeah, it's, they just weren't given the direction, the guidance. Hodan, did you want to ask another question? I saw you put something in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the moms said um, she hasn't, her, her son received EL services. And uh, we talked about earlier, uh, SPET uh, recovery services. Can we also get, she said, um, if you lose um, EL services, can you also get recovery services? I have not heard anything legally on that. However, what I know is that ELL services really have the same legal right as special education services. They can't just not do them. So it would be an interesting thing to play that one out. Um, but I see absolutely no reason for that parent not to tell the district, you got money for this and you're expected to provide a service. Explain to me how you're going to provide that service for my child. To add to the conversation, a tool that I recommend always as an advocate and also as a special ed director um, is as follows. You have a citizen's complaint tool. It's not intensive like due process. It's, it's fairly simple and it's effective. And what I would do in that story is I would prepare a citizen's complaint saying that my son, my daughter, whatever it would be, was denied services, ELL services. We're asking OSPI to investigate to see if they're entitled to recovery services. Yeah. And what I would do is go to the ELL coordinator and say, before I send this up the, the food chain to OSPI, I would rather work with you. I'd rather work with the district and find a solution. So here's what I got. I have a citizen's complaint ready to roll. So we could let OSPI figure out the answer to the story, or we could just do it better and figure out the answer ourselves. And that gives the district an, uh, an opportunity to save face, save a lot of time and create a partnership with you rather than having to go through the OSP uh, process of problem solving. And I totally agree with Larry. They always allow the district the opportunity to solve the problem. But if they don't show a desire or willingness to solve the problem, it's your baby. And, uh, you know, stand firm. So I've got a couple of questions from someone who I know had to leave. Um, uh, and she had posted them earlier. One has to do with getting a functional behavioral assessment uh, during remote learning. And she wrote that she's been told by the district that it can't be done in the remote setting. Um, but it was their private um, board certified behavior anal an analyst who actually said it was needed um, and that the son, ne the child needs a functional behavior assessment and a behavior plan now and is wondering what you would say to district staff um, in order to get that process going. So I do these um, and, and I train people to do these. And this is so difficult because trying to do an FBA, it's a, in large part is about the setting mm -hmm. because you're trying to understand 
what's occurring in aspects of the setting so that you can then help the child and also modify the setting as needed so that there's a higher level of success. So it's incredibly hard to do an FBA that's meaningful when a child is not in the setting that you need them to be in for that FBA. Um, so that's one where I'd be just saying, okay, don't tell me no. Tell me, how can we modify the FBA process for right now for where we're at? What could we learn from that? And then how will we prioritize it when we return to end process? Because it really is a very difficult thing to address in, in, in the current setting. Larry? I, I have a uh, situation that I've been helping a parent with. Uh, that's exactly this. Uh, there's two components, like Steve said. Uh, the student uh, performs a certain level of achievement at home with the parent and an ABA therapist, and then underperforms at school. Well, we can't measure that, like Steve said. We can't do the observations at school because it doesn't exist. But the district agreed to have their uh, school psychologist and behavior specialist to do observations um, through safety precautions and all that in the child's home working, uh, observing the child with the ABA therapist, as well as the parent to see what currently works. So then they could take that data, that evidence, those observations, do a cross comparison when the child comes back to school and see the difference between the two, they could get um, an interesting analysis of those two different snapshots. And that district agreed to do that. So we, like Steve said, we modified the process probably extended the time in terms of having it completed, but at least the parent feels like the district's moving forward. So I'm mindful of our time. Um, so I'm going to, I've got one more question that Yana had put in the chat before she had to leave. Um, and that is um, when you were talking about the prior written notice um, and she wondered whether it wouldn't be more effective um, and accurate for that matter to have a recording of the IEP meeting um, as opposed to relying on a prior written notice and wondered what you thought about that. So we talked about it at different times. So I, I'm not positive what we're referencing there, but if we're referencing about solely not doing certain goals while a kid is remote, but we don't want to remove them from the IEP, um, then it, you know, there's a lot of ways to accomplish that because I would not remove them from the IEP. Now we're recording of an IEP meeting is a very tricky thing because the Washington state laws, um, it's more often than not, you're just gonna be told no. And because the Washington state laws, the way they are, you can't force a recording of any kind of a meeting. Mm -hmm. So then you're looking at, um, I, do you just write out a longer document then a prior written notice. There's a lot of ways to go about that, but the key critical core issue is, are we achieving what we wanna achieve? Are we documenting it to make sure that if we're not achieving it, we know what route to take? Those are two really critical things. Larry? To add to it, if, if the IEP team meeting process has broken down such that you have to do recording and you're cross comparing recording, that, that kind of creates an adversarial relationship typically. And so I agree with Steve, it's very uh, dicey at best. In fact, there's a lot of legal uh, elements that are in favor of districts not be, you know, they could agree and say, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So I would strongly suggest utilizing the skill set, the tool of sound options, having them do IEP facilitation meetings, uh, if the district would agree to that. Because usually by that time, the process is broken down so bad that they're really grateful to have someone come in uh, like Sound Options and facilitate the meeting. And if they refuse a facilitated IET, IEP, I promise you'll probably get anything you want in the future. <laughs> it doesn't well, look good. <laughs> yeah, just saying. That's not a good one to refuse. No. 
Um, Larry and Steve, I want to thank you both for joining us tonight and um, providing your time to do this presentation. Um, and on behalf of the PTSA, thank you both um, and thank everybody who joined us tonight. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up that I'll quickly announce. I'll also ask one of my colleagues to throw our um, website and email and stuff like that into the chat. Um, we have actually tomorrow evening um, a sip and chat for Spanish speaking families. Our sip and chats are informal get togethers of students, uh, I'm sorry, informal get togethers of um, caregivers to share and support each other and share their stories. Um, and I believe that that is at seven o'clock, but it might be at six. So check um, check the website or Facebook or places like that to confirm the time, apologies. Um, and we have our monthly general meeting next Tuesday on the 19th. Um, and we will be presenting um, Lee Collier from OSPI as a guest speaker. And he's going to be talking about, um, uh, he's gonna be talking about the steps that can be taken at both a district and a school level um, to address school cultures that permit the use and the practice of restraint and isolation in response to student behavioral issues, um, which I think as most of you know, um, has been a significant issue here in Seattle, especially recently. Um, and so I encourage, I hope you can join us on Tuesday the 19th at seven o'clock um, for that conversation. Um, and uh, also on January 25th, um, Region 6 of Washington PTA is holding a listening session on um, special education. Um, and so we'll be posting more information about that shortly. Um, and on January 26th, um, the special education department at Seattle schools is holding a community forum for families of students with disabilities. Um, and uh, that I believe will start at 6.30 on, um, on Tuesday, January 26th. So um, again, thank you everybody for being here and we hope to see you at some of our future events. All right, thanks everybody. That was awesome.